I began to look at the evidence, the electromicroscopy that showed nerves on all the blood vessels that are controlled by the brain. It showed nerves contacting insulin secreting cells. And I realized, my gosh, actually, the body is, is changing up and down. It's not constant. Your pressure is going up and down, and your blood sugar is going up and down. And the reason it's going up and down is because the needs of the body change from moment to moment. The job of physiological regulation is really not to hold things constant. It's to vary them in order to provide resources just enough, just in time. I want to take just a moment to remind you about our new sponsor, the Neurology Minute. The Neurology Minute delivers one to two minute daily briefings of what you need to know in the field of neurology. The latest science focused on the brain and timely topics explored by leading neurologists and neuroscientists. The Neurology Minute is from the American Academy of Neurology with contributions by experts from the Neurology Journal's Neurology Today, Continuum, and more. Subscribe to the Neurology Minute wherever you get your podcasts or visit aan.com forward slash podcast for more information about the show. Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast where we explore how discoveries in neuroscience are helping unravel the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 178. If you're curious about how your brain really works, this is the podcast for you. Before I tell you about today's episode, I want to remind you that you can find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. Brain Science is produced independently and relies on the financial support of listeners like you. To learn more, please visit brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com or post on our Brain Science Podcast fan page. You can get show notes automatically via our free newsletter. Just text brain science, all one word, to 55444. That's brain science, all one word, to 55444. There will be a link to this in the show notes. Today, I'm going to be sharing the work of neuroscientist Peter Sterling. Dr. Sterling spent his career teaching medical students and exploring the function of the retina. He has written two fascinating books, Principles of Neural Design and What is Health? We recorded an interview that focuses on his new book, What is Health? Allostasis and the Evolution of Human Design. Unfortunately, the sound quality was very poor, and due to time constraints on my end, I was unable to schedule another recording. So I'm going to share the key ideas with you today, along with a few excerpts from our conversation. Let's start with the word allostasis. I can tell you from my firsthand experience as a physician that this is not a concept that students in physiology or medicine are being taught, even though Dr. Sterling first proposed the idea in the late 1970s. We are taught about homeostasis, which is the idea that health depends on keeping a large number of parameters within an acceptable range, like a thermostat. However, Sterling argues convincingly, I think, that this is an inadequate model of what's really going on. One reason for this, as mentioned in the opening quote, is that the needs of the body are constantly changing. Allostasis includes the idea that the brain tries to predict what the body will need. This will seem obvious to long-term listeners, since many of my guests have talked about the predictive properties of the brain. But before we explore that idea, I want to address the question I can imagine some of you have. Why does it matter? Why should I care about this? This brings us back to the title of Sterling's book, What is Health? Once we explore the evidence that supports Sterling's viewpoint about allostasis, we will examine its implications for our understanding of health and disease. What does this have to do with brain science? The brain doesn't just create our experience of the world. It is the key to our survival and health. 
Before I talk more about allostasis and why it's important, I want to clarify Sterling's use of the word design in his subtitle, Allostasis and the Evolution of Human Design. In both of his books, Sterling defines the term design as an overall scheme that governs the arrangements of elements and why they are just so. A key theme of his new book is evolutionary continuity from earlier life forms to humans. Our current human design is built on several key evolutionary developments. He describes four key evolutionary epochs. The first is that of the single cell, which went on for at least a billion years after the first life. During that time, the core metabolic processes, such as using ATP for gen- energy and the genetic code, remember that all life shares the same proteins and also enzymes, these all evolved. 75% of our proteins are homologs of those seen in prokaryotes, the first life forms. Later on, the prokaryotes became eukaryotes. Bacteria is an example of a eukaryote. Even bacteria have circadian rhythms. Epoch two is the evolution of multicellular organisms with various special compartments and finally the evolution of neurons. Epoch three is mammals with endothermy and lactation and the evolution of major brain structures like the hypothalamus. Finally, epoch four is humans with specialization and individual differences. During the interview, we talked a little bit about the differences between a living system and a machine and how that sheds light on why we need both homeostasis and allostasis. First of all, it's more than the fact that you just can't swap out parts like you could in a machine. There's a much higher level of complexity. Inside the cell, there's at least 10,000 different proteins that have to fold correctly for the cell to function correctly. And all biological organisms, even bacteria, can learn and store information. Life is constantly adapting to changing conditions. We talked about how allostasis contributes to adaptation. A good example is that when we're more active, we feel more hungry under normal circumstances, you know, when we're not overeating. And he pointed out the fact that, you know, there's a lot of health problems that we now have that are related to a lack of physical activity because we did not evolve to be the sedentary creatures that many of us are today. One key evolutionary development that Sterling emphasized was the appearance of bilaterally symmetrical organisms around 500 million years ago, in particular bilateral worms that led to arthropods and vertebrates. This ancestor bequeathed us 93% of our proteins, including key transcription factors, transmitters, neuromodulators, including dopamine. During the interview, we talked about C. elegans, that famous simple flatworm with its only 302 neurons. C. elegans uses dopamine as a reward signal. So the key idea is that the mechanisms of rewarding behavior with a small surge of dopamine, that's been with us for half a billion years. Well, you might be thinking, well, how does this get us from homeostasis to allostasis or predictive control? There are numerous pathways in the body that are regulated by homeostatic mechanisms. But a key idea is that as biological systems become more complex, homeostatic mechanisms waste energy, and energy is expensive. So it appears that the design principle is to use homeostasis when there's a critical link in the chain that lacks any reserve capacity, an essential bit. So autoregulation emerged in the first eukaryote cells. A good example of a critical link in the chain would be cardiac cells. They have to keep on beating, whereas other cells in the body might, quote, choose to be less active when the energy is low. Predictive control is an official initial strategy, but in rapidly changing conditions, it could make false predictions. So we need homeostasis to provide rapid, precise corrections. 
Regulation is not about defending fixed parameters. Allostasis predicts, while homeostasis corrects. Thus, they're both essential for survival. I want to emphasize the design principles that are seen in animals ranging from fruit flies to humans. They all use a clock. Remember, I said that bacteria have a circadian rhythm. They all need to prioritize conflicts, and the priorities are constantly changing. There's a need to match capacity to predicted need. That's the idea of just enough, just in time. There's a need to correct errors, homeostasis. There's a need to trade resources between functional modules. There's a need to adapt with the lowest cost. You want to regulate slow processes with chemical signals and fast processes with neural signals because neural signals are expensive. And in the neural system, you want to regulate at the lowest possible level because that's the fastest and the cheapest. So if it can be controlled at the spinal cord, it's controlled at the spinal cord. Then it moves up to the hypothalamus and finally up to the cortex because the cortex is the most expensive in terms of energy use. And there's a need for a design for emergencies. Of course, lots of important stuff happened later on with the emergence of mammals. Humans share all the key brain structures with other mammals, though when one thinks of traditional homeostasis, the organ that usually comes to mind is the hypothalamus. It's important to realize that the hypothalamus is actually mission control for allostasis, not homeostasis. It sends out and receives information at the lowest rates in the brain with the thinnest axons. This means that it consumes less energy than any other region of the brain. Mammals are characterized by being warm-blooded and by lactation. I want to take a moment to remind you about our sponsor, Text Expander. You can say goodbye to repetitive text entry, spelling, and message errors, and trying to remember the right thing to say. Because Text Expander makes it easy to say the right thing with just a few keystrokes. It's easier to copy and paste or use scripts and templates because Text Expander snippets allow you to customize what you write without repetitive typing. Best of all, you can use it on any platform and in any app, anywhere you type. I love having Text Expander as my sponsor because I literally use this app several times every day. Please visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast for 20% off your first page. That's textexpander.com forward slash podcast. And be sure to tell them that you heard about it on Brain Science. These two features are clearly interrelated because being warm-blooded requires a lot of energy and lactation provides a reliable means of feeding developing brains. I'm not going to go into much detail here because this is a topic we have discussed with other guests, including Patricia Churchland in episode 158. The key thing to remember is that being warm-blooded allows mammals to do everything faster, move faster, see faster, think faster. Sterling's book also details some of the changes that appeared in primates and key features that are unique to humans. But his main priority was discussing how our design leaves us vulnerable to what he calls diseases of despair. If you're like me, these last few months have given you a new appreciation for our need for social connection. But Sterling's focus was on the longstanding role of dopamine. As I mentioned early on, dopamine has been with us since our single-celled ancestors. The key idea is that the system is designed for small surges of dopamine. But the irony is that modern social conditions expose us to large surges from drugs, overeating, and even thrill-seeking. Adaptation is a feature of all receptors. This means that overstimulation causes the receptors to downregulate. Then we find ourselves needing more and more to feel the same level of satisfaction. Another important principle to remember when thinking about the dopamine reward system is that it is stimulated by surprises, both positive and negative. We've all had the experience of getting more enjoyment out of the anticipation than the actual outcome or an achievement. 
The most obvious consequence of this principle is the riding tide of drug addiction. Dr. Sterling emphasized that current approaches do not take allostasis into account. Here's what he said. And we have to live happier, more integrated lives. And I think allostasis and the idea of human design is we are designed as highly intelligent, highly cooperative, and highly inventive. And we have to live those lives. We can't avoid living healthy lives and hope that some drug will help us. Dr. Sterling also talked about how these same principles could change our approach to the so-called diseases of modern life. I found Dr. Sterling's writing compelling because of its emphasis on both our continuity with other species, but also on the unique qualities that make us human. I want to focus on how we can apply these ideas to our own personal lives. How can we recalibrate our reward systems so that small dopamine surges give our life a sense of satisfaction, whatever our personal circumstances? First, we need a conscious intention and an appreciation that it can be done. It's easy to get into a rut where everything in our life is expected and predictable, but that's not necessarily healthy. Can you make room for small surprises and the unexpected? I still remember that when I was in high school, my favorite class was actually PE because something unexpected could happen in PE, even if it was scary, like someone wanting to beat me up, whereas all the other classes were kind of boring because I always knew exactly what was going to happen. So this role for small surprises and the unexpected might be related to the fact that our brain health depends on learning new things. Perhaps the only thing you can do is learn new things, but that is its own reward. Besides the role of surprise, the other principle I hope you will remember is the idea of creating small pulses of dopamine so that we can recalibrate our receptors. I asked Dr. Sterling for his advice for how we could do this, and he said, first off, we need to remember about sharing because we are wired to be social and also spiritual practices and doing art and making music. He contrasted this with the many boring, repetitious jobs that exist today. And he actually commented that the only way you can do some of these jobs is to be stoned. So it's not a coincidence that drug abuse has skyrocketed. But even if you're in a bad job, you can still play an instrument, join other in sacred practices, whatever that means for you, write poetry, sing, play music, go to church. My own small suggestion or addition to the list would be keeping a gratitude journal to help us to focus on those small events in our lives that are rewarding, but that we tend to discount. Finally, he said we have to remember our responsibility to each other. I usually close my interview by asking for advice for students. So I'm going to close this section with Dr. Sterling's answer to this question. I think you have to just be ready to rethink what people are telling you and use your own eyes. Both in neuroscience and in medicine, I think a lot of things that you can see with your own eyes that you can make sense of, you have to use your own eyes and really think hard to see if what you're being told is true. And right now, for example, in my neighborhood here, I see, and I tweeted this the other day, a local farmer dumping a nerve gas insecticide on his tomato plants to kill cutworms, but he's destroying all the beneficial insects. And so when the time comes to reestablish agriculture, it's going to be hard because people are killing the environment. So I right now feel like medical students and neuroscience students need to be paying attention to the environment very, very seriously and climate change. Otherwise, that is a coming disaster, and I'm very concerned that we focus on that more than on the next drug. I want to thank Dr. Peter Sterling for taking the time to talk with me about his new book, What is Health? Allostasis and the Evolution of Human Design. This book is appropriate for all listeners, but it will be of particular interest to anyone who is curious about how our understanding of the brain and the nervous system could influence how we approach health in these challenging times. 
Please visit brainsciencepodcast.com for complete show notes and episode transcripts. I've included links to books and several papers by Dr. Sterling for those of you who might want to learn more. If you'd like to get episode show notes automatically, please sign up for our free newsletter. There's a link in the show notes, or you can text Brain Science to 55444. That's Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. I hope you'll send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com or post to the Brain Science Podcast fan page on Facebook. I want to thank everyone who has been supporting my work, either by buying my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty, and via premium, Patreon, and direct donations. Brain Science is produced independently, and it relies on the financial support of listeners like you. To learn more, please visit brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. Next month, I will be back with the 14th annual review episode. Until then, I hope you will check out my other podcasts, Books and Ideas, and Graying Rainbows. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you soon. Brain Science is copyright 2020 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can share this audio with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The theme music for Brain Science is Mind Fire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.